performance at an elite level, the margins are minuscule between success and failure. You get the same thing in the education system. You know, there's a really bad way to prepare for an exam. You know, I stayed up all night, ate junk food, had energy drinks, had too many coffees on the morning of the exam, couldn't concentrate, blew it. It's really no different to that application in a competitive context, whether you're playing football, esports, or whatever it is. I think it's quite famous now, you know, Dave Brailsford's Team Sky, British cycling mentality of, of finding those marginal gains. Um, there's a lot in that, right? You know, it wasn't an accident that, that they stumbled across it and the success that they found. Welcome to this next iteration of the British Esports podcast. Almost two years on exactly since the last time I sat down with Stephen English. Uh, we're here now on location at Williams HQ and I'm here to talk to Stephen about what's happened since we last spoke a few years ago, what the developments have been from a British esports perspective, but also at Williams Racing and at Williams Esports. Um, Stephen, just to take you back to that, back in 2022, we discussed what was at the time when you launched in 2018 a marketing project around esports. And it's really interesting now to look at how Williams Esports has grown since then. And we also discussed this convergence between sports, motorsports, esports, education, links to careers and industry. And um, since then, as British esports, we've had lots of global events. We've had things like the Commonwealth Esports Championships, which took place in 2022, various iterations of the Global Esports Games, European Esports Championships. And we've seen more growth in esports tournaments, viewerships, prize pools, etc. So really interested to dig into that a little bit more and get under the hood, so to speak, with you today. Um, where are Williams Esports now? What have you been up to? <laughs> Good question, yeah. So, sum up the last couple of years. Yeah. Um, I mean, a lot of the things that you listed there, they weren't objectives that we had when we launched Esports. You know, it was a long time ago now. It still feels like something relatively recent, but actually, um, you know, six years is, is time for a, a good amount of change and development. If in the beginning we were looking to compete in a new space and reach a new audience and and show Williams in a different light, particularly to people who may not um, remember us that far back in in an F1 context, everything that's come since has been an, an added, sometimes unexpected bonus, but an opportunity for us to just continue to deliver and exceed even what those objectives were in the first place. So, you know, you mentioned there about the development of of sport, if you like, of where esports sits in a wider sporting context. It was the virtual version of the real sport when we first started competing in F1 esports, but the esports space probably didn't overlap that clearly with the traditional sporting space. You know, it was very much gaming. And if you had, you know, connotations or perceptions of what competition and players in that space looked like, in, I think the last couple of years has been a really a, a journey that has developed such a long way. I mean, even looking back to the way that we went racing in 2022 is very different to what it is now. You sort of liken it a bit to Formula One. You know, you go back and look at decades past and there's you look at it now and go, I can't believe they used to go racing like that. You know, whether it's mechanics without fireproof overalls on or, you know, whatever. The sport just changes so much that it's not until you look back that you see that pace of change. Um we have very deliberately tried to build an environment that you would find in a traditional sports team here. And to that point, it doesn't really matter what the pursuit is, what the competition is. It could be driving a Formula One car. It could be running a marathon, riding a bike up an Alp. Yes, it could be playing games. We're fortunate in racing that the application of playing a game is probably closer to sport than other parts of gaming and esports. You know, we're sat here on a sofa now, but we don't play our games sitting on a sofa. We're fortunate to have the sim rigs that have a good bit of physicality and, and feedback and crossover to the application of the real world sport. But irrespective, even if we didn't do that, it helps us that we do. But even if we didn't, you know, you could be playing playing chess or, or like I said, sitting sitting on the sofa with a controller. Where you have performance at an elite level, the margins are minuscule between success and failure. You know, even the way that we used to run the team, we figured if we hired good enough drivers on a bad day, we'd still come fourth or fifth. We still have very good drivers, but on a bad day, you can be 14th or 24th because there's more competition out there and they're all performing at a higher level. So you have to search 
harder to find the gains. I think it's quite famous now, you know, Dave Brailsford's Team Sky, British cycling mentality of, of finding those marginal gains. Um, there's a lot in that, right? You know, it wasn't an accident that, that they stumbled across it and the success that they found. So that performance of body and mind applied to something, you can make big differences through areas that you might not expect. So we've made huge strides now in things like human performance coaching, you know, fitness training. Again, we're not asking guys to run up run up mountains and, and, and you know, swim the channel or anything like that. It's, it's relevant to the application that they're doing. But things like strength and conditioning, injury prevention, sleep and recovery, having proper nutritional planning, eating healthily and just preparing your body to compete at the top level in something. You know, you, you get the same thing in the education system. You know, there's a really bad way to prepare for an exam. You know, I stayed up all night, ate junk food, had energy drinks, had too many coffees on the morning of the exam, couldn't concentrate, blew it. It's really no different to that application in a competitive context, whether you're playing football, esports, or whatever it is. Um, so I think we've made huge strides forward in a competitive sense in just how we approach it. And that helps us with the underlying intention objective to bring esports to be seen more in a light with traditional sports and you know touching on our on our engagements in the education space we find a lot of schools and colleges now are saying that esports is no longer an after-school gaming club that people do as an extracurricular activity for fun it's actually now leaning into core curriculum it's becoming part of a of a sports department people are recognizing the benefits developing young people in, in sometimes it's skills like teamwork and competition and how to train and better yourself. Sometimes it's even more academic, you know, around the STEM subjects and application of technology and what we do. Um, and it's just all that helps to elevate it. And I think we we are, hopefully we are contributing to a, a wider picture where we're seeing the credibility of esports raise and the kind of mainstream recognition for the relevance of what it is. I think we see less and less now of of people saying, you know, oh, I don't want my child, family, friend, whoever, you know, wasting their time playing games. More and more people now are recognising that actually this is no real difference than playing semi-professional rugby and going on a tour to play in a tournament and win a cup and come back as a better, more developed person than you were before you left. And for me, it's been really rewarding to see gaming sort of take a seat at that table. Yeah, and I do think sim racing and, and that this convergence on esports, it definitely helps that as well. We We've seen and, and definitely felt that a lot from people's or roles or people in certain positions a few years ago who may have had that approach and may not have had the awareness now. And when you see something like this and you see a car pointing around a track, people understand what that is as well, don't they? they? They can relate to it and they get that. And I think throughout this journey where we've brought esports into academia and, and we've we've now seen lots of growth in the amount of colleges that are involved, the amount of schools that are involved, the amount of universities that are engaged in esports. From a curriculum perspective, when we first wrote the qualifications back in 2020, health and well-being for esports players was something that we wanted to make mandatory so that we, we knew the importance that that would have. And from working with students, thinking back to when we last spoke, it it felt like more of a challenge to, to discuss some of those topics with individuals whereas a few years on there are still individuals who have never been engaged in you know thinking about their mental health physical health social health within education and, and gaming so there's a real there's still a job of work to do there but I think culturally there's a bit of a shift now and understanding that lots of the pro teams do this and as you said it is a culture change isn't it to, to bring in those individuals um, to come in and work on performance at those levels I certainly see how how we do that within the classroom and how we try and get the buy-in there from students to, to show them the impact and reasons why this is important. What was that like here culturally with, if you think about the drivers or staff team or whoever it might be, bringing that angle in, bringing performance in, bringing well-being in? Did, did you notice any barriers at first or was it something that, 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 that they had a need and a want for and they sort of open arms and said, yes, come in and help me with these things? What, what, how did you find that? Yeah, I think the word I pick up on there is culture. Yeah. And it can be a culture shock for people because it's a big change. It's a transformation from what they're used to. And 
different people react differently to change. Different people are more open to break out of it and embrace a new way of doing things. In gaming and, and where competitive esports was and how it got to that point, it can sometimes be more challenging because people have been so independent to that point. If I'm, I mean, whatever age really, but if I'm 16, 17, 18, and I'm you know somewhere near the top of the world at competing in a certain game, the chances are that because of where the industry was during my development years, the reason I got to where I got to was all me. I sat at home and did it on my own, my way. It was trial and error. I learned you know, my preferences. Even if you're in a team, you're maybe not playing in a true team environment way. It can still be quite an individual approach to things. And it's a competitive industry where people are striving to make pro, people are striving to earn a living or, you know, to earn as much as they can, prize money competing against others. And it is like any competitive sport. It can be dog eat dog. You know, if you're at the top today and someone else comes along and beats you, you might not be at the top anymore. You might get replaced. Someone else might take your spot. And so what we're asking people to do in this culture is put their faith in the way of working, the way of behaving and believing that we're trying to implement, that it will take them further forward in the long run but we're asking people to take a risk on us because the first thing that anybody wants to do when you're faced with challenge or adversity is go back to what i know go back to what i'm comfortable with go back to what got me here go back to what i trust and it has been not you know it's not without its challenges we've got a big roster we compete across a lot of different games and titles and so we work with lots of different people different ages different backgrounds different places in life, even different things they want to get out of esports. Some want to be an esports pro and, you know, earn millions and buy a beach house and, and others, it's, oh, yeah, lovely. love to. Um, <laughs> others, it's just, it is more of a, I'm not going to say hobby because it probably undervalues the, the level, but it is a more of a part-time participation around other things in life. And so depending where you are on that scale, maybe also influences your, decision your buy-in to transform to a new culture and way of doing things we've certainly found where we've got players who come from a not necessarily professional but an elite sporting background we've got drivers that are also real world racing drivers they find it easier because that culture is more natural to them if you have a player who's grown up playing a team sport you know outside in a field somewhere again it comes more naturally to them so it's totally down to every individual What's their value system? What are their beliefs? What do they default to when the going gets tough? And it's not for everyone. You can't kind of break the programming of everyone. That, you know, again, this is what got me here. This is what I'm going to go back to. Um, but the better job we can do to show the potential. And if you show someone, this is how you used to do things. And this was your ceiling that you kept banging into. It didn't matter what you tried to do differently, what you tried to learn, what you tried to change. You just kept banging into the ceiling. Trust us, believe in us, do it this way, and now we'll show you that your ceiling's higher. Once you show people that, you tend to have them. They're converts, they're on the journey, they'll go with you. And there are some who will, you know, follow our coaching system into battle blindly doing whatever we say. And there are others that still think they know best. And sometimes they do, because sometimes there's something really intricate about the game or what's necessary for competition where they are still the expert. And it's this juxtaposition of the kind of traditional origins of competitive gaming versus bringing the approach from elite performance sport. It obviously works. So many sports follow this methodology and you can look at any sport in the world and they probably put a lot of this um, team of, of resource and expertise around their athletes, around their players. It definitely works, but you have to find the right way to apply it to different disciplines. And it's not the same. You can't just take a football coaching system and apply it to league of legends and expect it to work overnight you you've got to be quite niche but there's a lot of buy-in there but then that i think help as well sorry with buy-in from families and parents of you know the players that are coming in that are looking to be part of the organization when they realize that there's this extra level of personal social holistic support that exists around around the culture and around the drivers because i can imagine that helps with Quashing some of these stereotypes and possible misconceptions, especially when you've got young, young talented individuals coming in, that, that 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 supports there as well. It helps us with, you know, our roster, our players, our staff. Like you say, it's a lot of young people in a very 
developmental stage of life, but a very crucial stage of life about making decisions for the future. Are you opening doors for the future or are you closing them? And I think something we've had to battle against is this preconception that commitment in esports means closing doors to other things. Are you going to drop out of education to grind on a game 24-7? Are you going to turn your back on other pursuits and other ways to develop yourself? And it's been really important that alongside our performance program, we've built a futures program, which its origins were probably in around about the, the time we, we spoke on the previous podcast about making sure that we're giving, not just giving people opportunities, because at that point in life and development, you do kind of have to pull the horse to the water rather than just you know, let, let it see it in the distance, but making sure that we are offering people opportunities in lots of different directions. So, you know, all these things that we've added into what we do, they're all extra jobs. They're all extra careers. They're all extra modules that you would build into curriculum to teach people about this industry, about this subject. So we find, and I don't mean that we're by no means the only ones doing it, but what we're doing is helping the education space to create the construct of what you're teaching in a more credible, holistic view of overall value. At a granular level, it helps us with the parents of a player understand what we're doing and buy into it more. As and one example, as part of our futures program, you have an opportunity with our team to get funded places on education courses that would otherwise cost you thousands. And parents come to us blown away. What do you mean that by playing games with you, I can save 10, 20 grand on my child, you know, going to university? And now I've got their buy-in. They might not like them sitting in the bedroom eight hours a day grinding on a sim rig, but you suddenly you pay all the uni bills. You're having a different conversation. And it, I think it works at all levels. What I've seen as well and what I've noticed with, especially in sim racing, I've, I've noticed um, that that approach, that other teams are noticing it as well now. And whilst you never want to give away the secrets and the keys to the city, I think how open... Williams of eSports have been around sharing that this is what we do here. I think I've started to see other organisations take note of that, which from a professionalisation of the industry as a whole perspective, I think is really helpful as well. I think it's really beneficial. Yeah. I mean, I think we're, we're probably contributing to that against our will. You know, we'd, we'd probably rather not have everyone aware of what we're doing because you lose a bit of a USP and, and there's sort of an advantage over the rest. But at the same time, it's really important for us to shout about the good work that we're doing because you take this all back to brand. What does Williams mean to people? What do you associate with Williams? We want people to associate elite performance, innovation, development, revolutionizing an industry, you know, positive life development, you know, education, career prospects. It's why we host so many education immersion days and school visits and things like that, because it's important for us to build what Williams means to people into it. And to do that, we do have to you know, open the door a little bit and let people see what we're doing. And if others, I get, I don't mean copy us because, you know, we're not the only people in the space, but if that inspires the wider industry to professionalise and to, to raise the standards across the board, then it has to be a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. And you mentioned there the, the immersion days and the STEM days, and of course, where we sat here today, the, the whole purpose of this and, and why we've got cameras this time is uh, because we're on location, because we, we want to try and showcase where we are and, um, that these facilities are here and that they exist. And when you come into this to this building and to this, you know, into the whole campus here at Williams HQ, it's a place that's absolutely steeped in heritage. You know, the the history of, of Williams is here. It's here for you to see, to feel. You can see the trophies, the the, the heritage collection, the, the Formula One cars through the ages. And then this is a, a nod to the now, but also to the future. And I think there, as you mentioned, STEM and education. We've since we last spoke again back in 2022, we were we were focused really on on the what was at the time the development of the BTEC programs at level two and level three. Majority 16 to 19 year olds, some at 14 to 16. Since then, we've seen growth in the amount of schools and colleges that are taking part. So we've now got over 160 colleges that are delivering those programs um, and a number of schools. I do update my number. I yes. still say no, I'm the funny. Yeah, so we're up, 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 I think it was 164, the last the last count. So so there we go. We've got a number, almost 10,000 students have now studied those in the last four academic years. But then what we've seen a need for and a demand for around that is more in secondary schools and then growth at, at higher education as well. So in secondary schools, we've developed uh, leadership and esports qualifications appropriate for key stage three, key stage four, 
take the first steps in into esports and understanding what this industry is. And at the other side of that, September this year, we've got launching the higher nationals, so the level four, level five, year one, year two, university degree equivalency. And going back to 2018, we had the first university that started an esports degree. We've now got over 20 different higher education or university providers and over 50 different programs and courses, all linked to esports. So we've really seen that growth. One of the key areas for us, given, you know, our, our relationship and, and how we'd spoken about esports and how supportive Williams Esports had been of the, the BTEX was around accessibility then. We started to talk about accessibility and I remember us talking about what does accessibility to motorsport look like? What does accessibility to esports look like and is there an opportunity? And the analogy that I use is um, is of Lewis Hamilton of, you know, thinking of somebody, a family from a working class background who have got to work so hard to get into an industry that may just seem like it's not for you, that it's not accessible. You know, if, if my parents have got full-time jobs and if I haven't got a camper van and a go-kart, and a, am I going to be a driver? You know, that that analogy, if you like. What we've seen since then is this development now of the Student Racing League, which um, we ran a pilot last year, uh, and then this year we, we've just held the grand finals here at, at Williams HQ. Um, where we've started to see now around talent identification. I've been able to identify individuals that are talented in sim racing rigs, but then also there's a huge engineering side to this racing league as well. So just as a, as a first point, can you tell us a bit about that thought process with the Student Racing League and linked to accessibility for drivers and for people potentially who are interested in STEM and engineering? Yeah, I mean... The headline is, is, to your point, making motorsport accessible to as many people as possible. You know, we as a team need a fan base. You know, we want people to support Williams to be on board, but we also need people just to love the sport in the first place because if you don't like Formula One, you're probably not going to be that interested in, in following Williams. And I think every sport faces that challenge of where does the next generation of fan base come from? Some sports, it's easier than others. You know, you get the old analogy of, of dad taking son along to the terraces to watch the same football club the family supported for generations. Maybe that's easier. Formula One is, it is a difficult, uh, you know, it's, it can seem like quite a closed environment with not so many opportunities to break in. And you can be a fan from afar, but can you feel part of it? Can you feel like you're engaged, like you're participating? And one of the kind of accidental benefits really of when we started our engagement with, with sim racing was these sims aren't only for our drivers competing at the elite level. These sims could be for absolutely anyone. You know, this this venue has, I think, something like 100 schools a year come through this venue now. I think students aged kind of year seven to nine um, will come through and have a it's, a... it's a STEM day where it's opening their eyes to potential passions. It can be careers, but it could just be general interest in, in fields of study um, that are ignited by the hook. So my own example, I grew up a motorsport fan from when I was tiny, but I wasn't that interested in STEM subjects at school because I hadn't really built the link between something I was really passionate about and development in that area. So I sit here today not as an engineer or a particularly knowledgeable or useful person to a Formula One team going racing. If you, the generation now, if you, can, if you can ignite the passion and you can help them to kind of fill in the blanks between... This is where these are opportunities that could be ahead of you. It could be career focused. It could just be, um, you know, pastime, passion, hobby focused. So it's about getting as many people as possible to have the opportunity to use sims and to build a passion for racing. The more we were working with yourselves and talking to more education centers around the country, we saw an appetite to bring racing more into the esports and gaming offering. You know, obviously we're biased being sat here at a Formula One team, but Racing games offer so many benefits compared to other areas within gaming. You know, some of them we've touched on and the, the sort of, again, positive impact and even just being something that's more easy to understand because you know what the real world sport is. Um, and I think using the attributes and benefits of what you do in a sim can maybe help schools, colleges and unis to get the most out of building a, a, a gaming venue, a sim installation, relating it to academic courses if it's relevant to do so um so the the stem groups that come in here it's quite similar to the student racing league is 
we need to need to get more people racing you know it's a it's a sport that you understand and enjoy more when you know what it's like to be doing it and so you know the pilot that we did last year um you know we had 10 schools and colleges at first that that either had sims already or that we could help get them into to kind of get them off the ground and get it going and as soon as you get a product out there as soon as you see either students or your enthusiastic advocates, course leaders, you know, from other institutions look at this thing and go, well, that looks really good. Could we get the opportunity to do that? Yeah, sure. Come on in, build it. So I think we're we're over 50 centres now participating this year. And 30 of them were here, as you say, for the, for the finals a couple of weeks ago. Um, we'd like to see it grow and grow, but also we're learning what it means to the people involved and how the opportunities grow for the people involved. I remember when we first had I think the very first level three esports college that visited us, we did a show of hands of, you know, why are you studying esports? And I think about 90% of the class wanted to be a pro player. Fine, you know, it's a great aspiration to have, but you have to be realistic about how many people can see that through. And I think now that people are becoming more aware that there's an industry and there are career pathways that can be linked to your passion, you know, if you love football, but you won't, good enough or boy, maybe you got injured or whatever to be a footballer you may still work in football there's there's a thousand and one jobs in the football and sports industry where you can go to work every day to a job and live your passion and gaming and racing and f1 can be exactly the same and to your point you know we've had people here who are really quick on the sims and you know they're, they're probably on the fringes of a competitive level of esport competition we've also had people here who absolutely love the opportunity to get involved in engineering coaching and teamwork we've had students that want to get involved in the broadcasting commentary and the event hosting and all these things that we didn't have in mind on day one but when you see it happen you just recognize an opportunity and say we can add something here and the college is now you know can we bring more people in can we get them involved in this it just adds value to like you say the growth of the whole industry i'm not surprised that you're seeing such a growth in courses and centers taking it on because i'm sure they can all see the same benefits and I think this, again, it crosses over, doesn't it? It crosses academic subjects. But it's that accessibility piece that no matter where you are now in the UK, for us, talking about the Student Racing League, there becomes an accessible point if you've got the kit and the equipment or if you go through the hot lap leaderboard. So just to give some context to people listening that may not be involved in the Student Racing League, um, it's it's for people within education to enter teams you can enter sim- in simple terms a two driver racing team you create a race team and um, you'll then join the student racing league through qualification through hot lap leaderboards and then once you're part of one of the the leagues you'll go on the the f1 circuit not physically from your school or college against other schools and colleges but we'll we'll put that series together and, and you'll race and the, you know there's qualification there's racing there's strategizing the engineering part to me has been a big learning curve as someone who's not an engineer, but seeing the teams down here, looking at what the drivers were doing in terms of race strategy as whether they might have a first driver or second driver, looking at where they were in the race, whether it was a sprint race, whether it was the final race, whether they were qualifying, looking at the position. Uh, there was one example that we discussed earlier where in the final race, second and third both got a five second penalty. So then you had fourth and fifth but they were just outside that five second gap just so to see how their race strategy changed immediately once they realized there was a an opportunity to to get a to get a podium finish was just incredible uh, in terms of what the drivers are doing speaking to some of the drivers the settings that they're changing on the wheels every second third corner and then of course from that engineering side what we've seen not necessarily with the group that we had last year because they were a lot of our esports BTEC centres, but since we've we've put in the, the second and third split, when they came and I asked where, what they were studying, a lot of those students were studying engineering or motor vehicle, motorsport, um, engineering T-level students, for example, using the telemetry data, using the same engineering software here that they would use if they were on a race track with a race team. And those opportunities just don't exist without travelling. So we're now seeing some of the first centres go, right, yeah, we we need a facility like this in our environment to be used by sports students, media students, 
esports students and engineering students all at once. And and I think that's been an amazing step forward in terms of what this is doing for esports, but also for engineering motor vehicle. When when students then come here for the final, uh, this year we had some careers talks, didn't we, from, from Williams Esports and from Williams and from ourselves at British Esports. Uh, can you tell us a bit more, Stephen, about that link to engineering and then what are the opportunities for schools and colleges that get involved in terms of being able to come here, being able to engage with Williams and Williams Esports? Yeah, I think the thing the Student Racing League does is offers that depth to take it as far as you want to. You know, anyone can buy a game at home and sit and play it and you won't get the same out of it. We could go and sit in the rigs now and we'd turn left at the left corners and we'd go, you know, accelerate and brake and that would be about it. But to your point about the depth they go in when, you know, when drivers are racing and they're making decisions, you know, multiple times every lap about changing the brake bias or the, the engine mapping or you know, that you say an earlier, you can, you can make your car tenths of a second faster every lap by understanding the physics of how the car works, how the game works, how technology and engineering impacts performance. And, you know, you can make significant difference by the end of the race. And and these, some of these are in secondary schools. Yeah. And then it, it, honestly, when I was speaking to it, it blew my mind. Not only are they not crashing <laughs> they're, and they're racing against somebody wheel to wheel, but they're also doing all of this stuff at the same time. Right. Just a minute. You have to have, to perform at an elite level in the game, I'm not going to say supersedes academic learning, but it's different, right? Like you say, you find a 14-year-old driver that's processing more decision-making and maturity and understanding than they might show in whatever lesson they don't care about at school because they've found a place that, that ignites their passion where they want to go into that depth. And it's as deep as you want to go. Um, you know, you mentioned the point about engineering telemetry and software we have engineers on our esports team that are real world race engineers they literally one week they will be in the paddock at barcelona running a racing car the next week they're here engineering a sim race and it's the same you know they use the same software literally the same processes as the formula one team uses because it's just data that you analyze you know the little squiggly line on the screen doesn't know whether it came from a sim or from a real car you're doing the same you're performing the same task you've got the same objective whether you're developing setup and you know trying to find weaknesses or looking at different strategy options people here you know for the final the other week are they're watching the race and looking at how many laps to go and tire deg per lap and what lap can we change to this tire and still get to the end and that that depth of engineering is something that is I hadn't really looked at it that way, but it's probably quite difficult to find in a school or college environment because you would have to go out into the world and do a work placement or or take on some opportunity so for us to say hey we're playing games you know on a wednesday afternoon we've got a we've got a game you can all play in but actually here's what they can learn here's what they can practice here's what they can get out of it we've had um engineers that have gone purely from sim racing that's what propelled them in their career into real world motorsport so it's not like you're already a real world engineer and you do a bit of sim racing it can actually be a career development pathway we're exploring now in the early stages of it but we're exploring now what a sim program looks like for a, an academy driver in the real world so williams has got a young driver academy with drivers down f2 f3 f4 right down to karting you will try and advance the career and the development ceiling of a young driver just like you would a young athlete football or whatever the tools that you can use and the training programs you can put them through to do that might be heavily focused on the real world because that's that's their bread and butter that's what they do but they can't do it 24 7 you can't get in a car and drive around a racetrack 24 7 you pretty much can do this 24 7 so we're looking at okay what's the assessment and evaluation what's the training program what are the skills soft skills as well as driving skills that you're looking for what does good look like and again in our context it's in an elite driver you know, performing higher than everyone else. But in another context, you could apply it to any career, to any industry, like you say, content, events, engineering, coaching, anything. What does good look like? What's the opportunity to test it in this environment? And you'll soon find out because it's competitive. If you think you're the best school in the country at doing this and you turn up to the league and come last, you're going to realise there's some work to do and it's going to push. You know, you never develop faster than when you're being pushed competitively. Yeah, and, and it's been amazing following the, the league this, this year. Um, I've seen some amazing interactions between 
F1 teams on the grid in terms of colleges that might be using a certain car in the race. And we just pull them out of a hat, don't we? We know when they start the league, we'll, we'll pull out of a hat and whoever's lucky enough to get the Williams one it is, is, is what we're hoping people are celebrating. Um, but whatever, whatever car you're in, I've seen um, schools, colleges, you know, clipping highlights and um, engaging with those F1 teams on Twitter and, and they've had responses saying we're watching and we're watching the drivers and they're doing well and they're being successful. So this, there's a digital footprint here of what's actually happening. As you said, there's the stream, there's the broadcast. And what I absolutely love about when you walk in to this part of the building, you know, you, you come in and, and you've been through the, the Heritage Museum, for example, and you've seen the cars and you walk into reception and you see the F1 car and, and, and the wheels and the tyres and you walk up and you come in and you see lots of Williams Esports staff. There are lots of people in this room and in this building making this all happen. So for some of those people who may not have been aware of esports from maybe an engineering background, they're then going, I didn't realise this was a thing. I didn't realise that. So we're also, the other way as well, as you said, you might have people now from a different background being made more aware of esports and this exists. And as we discussed earlier, your operation has grown significantly in, in the last few years in terms of Williams esports. Um, just to touch on Williams in general then, are there opportunities for things like work experience programs, gap years, internships across Williams Esports or Williams? If if people are out there listening and think, I've got students who'd be really interested, how do they engage with that sort of program? Yeah, definitely. It's it's always been a strong pillar of Williams to engage in the education space. You know, as an F one team, we're you know probably competing with the rest of the F one grid for the the top engineering grads from unis every year for aerodynamicists and designers so it helps that as an organization we're skewed to to recognize the value of in, in, engaging in the education space so williams the, the whole company runs an annual work experience program which i think has about six to eight weeks a year where students can come in uh, i think it's mostly 16 to 18 but some has come, some can still be um, current gcse program students i think um, and they will come and do a kind of an f1 introduction and they'll spend you know half a day in different departments learning you know what is what does it take to put an f1 team together to your point a lot of people work here i think there's nearly a thousand people that work at williams and you know there's only two of them sat in the car on a sunday so everyone else is, is doing something um so they can come and find out about that this year is the first year that we've run esports work experience placements in parallel with the wider f1 so each work experience week we take four or five students to come and spend the week with us in esports and they'll spend a day each doing content and broadcast or social or they'll work on the event side of the business if we've got events in this facility they'll help to run it and prepare the sims host the guests that might work on the coaching side of our team they might get involved in the business and commercial and marketing side of the team so just exploring all those different jobs they didn't maybe didn't know existed um, we host we've done a couple so far of what, what we call industry immersion day so the colleges you know some of the level three colleges will come in um, and it'll be a you know a really intensive day because there's quite a lot to to get through you know to, to a lot of content to, to show people in one go. Um, they'll come and do some practical tasks that helps to bring it to life and you know learn a bit about our business, learn a bit about the industry, what jobs are out there, what skills we're looking for, how you develop. But then kind of roll your sleeves up and get your hands dirty and say right you know you, you're creating your own fictitious esports team here. What do you need to consider? You know do you want more of this, less of that, less of that? Or or they we we get them. Um, organizing and hosting a, a a mock event and that experience i think is is kind of great for them to see what it would actually be like to have a job in this space um so i think we do that maybe once or twice a half term colleges come i think through british esports they if they've got a relationship there they can they can apply to arrange those visits um we do the those work experience programs can be a an offshoot of those industry immersion visits so students will, will i think that we did the first week last month and I think two of the students on it had previously been on a college visit here and the next step was to say today was brilliant you know I learned so much I loved it what can I do next oh well, if you apply here you can come back for a week you know and learn a load more uh, we've currently got I think three 12 month internships in the team so it's important for us from a, um, a talent development perspective to have a pipeline into careers because 
esports is still a challenging industry to recruit in because you don't find that many CVs with five, ten years of experience in in esports because it's such a, a new industry. So if we're looking to recruit people at kind of university graduate age, hopeful that they've got relevant experience, we can sit back and do nothing to add to that or we can actually create the experience for them and hope that others do the same. Um, so we've got interns at the minute, um, one on the event side of the business, one in broadcasting and one in marketing and social. And that is an opportunity for, they, they could be graduates, so they don't have to be university graduates. Sometimes it can be kind of level three age graduates, but to come in for 12 months and and you will see and cover a lot of ground in, in that time. You know, we we work them hard, they do a lot, but they will leave at the end of that 12 months you know, our intention is, you know, really well-rounded and experienced and, and from our perspective, ready to go into esports employment. You know, it could be anywhere in the industry. It could be with us. It, it may not be. And then we're looking at our relationships, whether it's with certain colleges and universities or whether it's with courses and programs to say, what do graduate opportunities look like? What, you know, we're only one employer and we don't have infinite jobs available. So it's, it's difficult to do something in-house that, that can be relevant to everybody but looking at what we can offer to the industry and how we can help to prepare people for jobs. And even a lot of, you know, podcast webinars, any opportunities that we get to um, to kind of share our insight and advice back into the education space is, is to try and help people prepare, to be best prepared to work in the industry because it is also competitive. Yeah, which again, though, is, is amazing. And, and I think and I think is needed from a from an education perspective the young people in our education system now are so more digitally evolved than we've ever had and so more engaged and and involved with technology in their lives daily anyway that it it feels like there's still a lack of awareness of the opportunities. And I think things like this that can raise awareness and showcase there are opportunities to engage, but also that there's an impact at the end, that something happens, that there are opportunities work experience, programs, internships, and ultimately employment opportunities for individuals. I think it is is fantastic. And I hope there are people listening today that weren't aware that are now um, and that are now going, that sounds really exciting. I want to get involved. I want to join the Student Racing League. I've got lots of students who I know would benefit from work experience. And, and one example, just, just to give uh, as a think about accessibility and, and part of the reason for why we've done this in the first place was uh, from our campus that we've just opened up in Sunderland the National Esports Performance Campus uh, on the Student Racing League had started and alongside Split 1 Split 2 we then have the Hot Lap, hot lap leaderboard don't we that people can enter um, you know lap times and, and we can find out if again the data doesn't lie if you're quick it will show you that you're quick if you're not quick it will show you that you're not quick and then you're going to have to improve and um one of the students from Sunderland College, I'd, I'd been saying to them, because they deliver their BTEC programmes for our campus, uh, I'd said to them, have you got any drivers or you know engineering students or is anybody, is anybody involved in go-karting who might want to get involved? Um, and, and one of the students came forward and, and he came down and, and got in one of the sim rigs. And I thought I was being confident after setting what I thought was a good time on Monaco. Turns out it was a rubbish time. And he came in straight away, changed his settings, settings and beat my time by four seconds then five seconds then six seconds and i and i sent i sent you an email Stephen, now saying the young manager's walked in and he's quick um i know the league started what what can we do and and that's where we then entered him into the hot lap leaderboard and he ended up pairing with somebody from another college down in the south of england and then they came here for the finals for split three and they won and, and they won that and he is quick and then he's coming back um I think I think in June, I think he's coming back for a week's work experience. And that would just never have happened. For somebody in Sunderland, they would just never have come here for a, a week's work experience programme. So I think that's that's already, as, as example one, testament that this is working. And I think for anybody else who might think that that sounds like them, they're in a, 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 an area that's a long way away or a rural location or motorsport can be for you and esports can be for you i think it is an important message i think that's the most important thing we're doing is op opening the door yes. you know we've i know you're from barnsley i know the guys from burnley college um i'm from middlesbrough and there's a school in that area that's been competing in our league and the guys from Sunderland, you know all over the country but the consistent message that people say is 
our students never get opportunities like this. You know, from where we're from, where we're based in the country, what their social demographic backgrounds are, it's just natural. Our students grow up believing that these opportunities are not for them. They'd have to be from somewhere else or be different in some way. And what we're saying is, no, this is for everyone. We don't care where you're from. You, everyone's got the same opportunity. It's not about who's the most privileged or who's got the most money or the most access to, to something. And even for our final, I think we had people coming down from Sunderland. There was a team that came up, I think, from Exeter. Yeah, we'd... Belfast met, came over, didn't they? Yeah. Belfast flew over as well. Yeah, it's the the reach, and I, and, and I can just see that's going to grow and grow and grow. Um, the last bit of reflection that I had on, on our conversation a couple of years ago to now and so much has happened in this short space of time, which is what we wanted to try and share with people today um, in, in terms of the growth, is we finished the last podcast on your advice um, for people who might want to get into this industry, for students who might want to get in. And um, there were three key pieces of advice that I won't do it justice, so I won't try. But essentially that was around skills, knowledge and experience. And then I famous, famously remember you saying, you have to get off your ass and be proactive. So I think those three things will still apply. But is there anything now that you would add to that, given the growth of the industry, growth of Williams, as any Williams Esports as an organisation? Is there anything else now, two years on, for anybody that's thinking next steps? And that doesn't have to be in this industry. It could be anything. Anything that you'd add to that as a piece of advice? Yeah, I think, you know, we've seen development in in a recruitment sense, in, in a career sense in the industry, that there is a lot more out there now. So, you know, one problem in the past was that maybe it was quite difficult to get experience and find an opportunity because there wasn't much there, but it meant that those who could get a bit of experience could elevate themselves quite easily. If we're looking at applications, Williams gets, you know, 100 and whatever, app, you know, decent, credible applications for any job it posts just because of, of who we are as a brand and, and a lot of people want to work here. So you have to stand out. If there were people that had been proactive and got a bit of experience and built their knowledge and skills, they would tend to stand out. You know, there might only be two of them in, in, in a batch of applicants that have done that. And so even though you're in a difficult space, it was sort of quite easy to separate yourself from the crowd. I think now, I mean, we've just talked about how many schools and colleges and universities in the country are now increasing their activity. So we receive a lot more cover letters and CVs now from students that say, I've been running the school esports broadcast of this tournament that my college does for the last two years. And you said, great, but so is every other school. So you're, not, you're no longer the only one that's got that experience because everyone else has got it too. And we were talking to a group of, of college students, a similar conversation to this about saying, you know, how do we, how do we give ourselves the best opportunity to be uh, successful and, and to, to proceed in, in life? And the, the way that we were talking about it, I think there was sort of a lack of recognition of the competitive landscape when you are trying to build a career. And it's different for different jobs. You know, some jobs, the demand might not be that high or it might not be such a... Um, a desirable industry or brand to work for and i'm i'm sure in esports is competitive across the board because there are so many people that would like to work in it but especially somewhere like williams it doesn't have to be williams you know whatever your whatever your passion point is um if it's a, a highly desirable place you have to look at it with a competitive mindset we were talking to them about when they race on the sims when you line up on the grid to start a race you're very aware that you're competing against 19 other people to win this race because you can see them sat around. And when you race through the first corner, you, you know how many you've overtaken, how many are still ahead of you. And when you apply for a job or you're trying to build your career prospects, you don't see the race quite as clearly. But I think to try and help people understand that they are in a race and it is competitive. And, you know, if we have an opportunity for, a, you know, a graduate esports role here, there will be 99 people competing for that role. So if you're applying for it or if you're, a, a teacher, a lecturer, a college trying to give your students the opportunity to stand out, you need to be really clear that they're competing against 99 other people for this opportunity. And it, whatever you think you've done to follow the the sort of advice from two years ago, you know, get the knowledge, get the skills and be proactive and, and, and gain your opportunities. What if everyone else has done that too? Where are you on the grid? Do you think you're in pole position applying for this job? Because it's easy to, you know, do a nice CV, do a nice cover letter that shows your experience, submit it and think, 
oh, if they like me, I'll get the job. And you don't really picture the other 99 people that are doing the same thing. And it, you know, racing is, is, is dog eat dog. You know, you, you get your elbows out and, and shove the other car off the track in a legal way if you have to, to make sure that you get to the front. And it's sort of the same preparing yourself for career opportunities. You know, I'd, I'd sort of set that question to people and say, if you imagine there's a grid of people applying for whatever it is you're applying for, if you're preparing students for their next step, if every other college is doing the same thing, where do you think you are on the grid? Are you putting yourself in pole position? Are you putting the students in pole position? Or are you a little bit complacent? And do you not realise that you're only 15th on the grid? And actually, do you have to work harder? Do you have to be better? Do you have to be more dedicated, more experienced? Do you have to want it more than the other people that are applying for it? Because it is it is tough. You know, for me, recruiting in this space, it's getting a little bit easier because the quality and the volume of applicants is increasing. So it makes it easier for us as employers it makes it more difficult for someone trying to stand out and succeed of course um Stephen, thank you so much as always it's genuinely always a pleasure having the time to have these conversations with you and chats with you thank you for taking time out of your day to educate us all to help us all understand what's happening here at williams and i think some of that career advice again right at the end there that analogy I think that will will land with people and and people will be able to really appreciate and understand that. Uh, If that's been of interest to everybody, hopefully people are still watching and it has been of interest and you want to get in touch, please do reach out to us at British Esports. If you're thinking about the Student Racing League, if you're interested in some of these amazing opportunities to engage here at Williams, again, come and get involved, reach out and we can help you on that journey to getting you set up, to entering leagues, to providing opportunities for students and for young people. Um, Once again, Stephen, thank you so much for your time, as always. And um, for everybody else out there listening, please do stay in touch with us, follow us on socials. Likewise, for Williams Esports as well, you'll find both of us on all social uh, channels. Um, So please do engage with us, and I look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you.